rotation without the interference of the gyroscopic forces. And as you process the machine, forces are developed in the walls, and no reaction torque appears in the axis. Now, let's go to the next slide. This is what it looks like in reality. There are two motors, uh, each one driving one side of the axle there, the way the flywheels look inside. This, unfortunately, is upside down, but that's how the, uh, that's how the, the motors and the bearings are situated on the flywheel, so to, pretend, to make the whole thing high precision. Two, two, two needle bearings on either side, and one ball bearing on the top of the bottom. Now, if you do an experiment with this apparatus, and you, you cause it to precess, and the drum of the cylinder to rotate at velocity revolutions per second, 3.8 revolutions per second, we found that if you allow it to slow down into a very massive load, such that it was not affected by vibration or any temperature effect or anything, that it took longer for the cylinder to slow down when the flywheels were rotating inside than it did when they weren't. And there's about a 14% increase in the inertial mass of a processing gyroscope in this experiment. Now this is very, very interesting because the only way that inertial mass is supposed to change is at light speed velocities and close to it. Here's an effect which is going on at very low speeds. These are going 10,000 RPM and processing at 3.8 revolutions per second. So this is in the range of, of mechanical velocities which can be achieved on the Earth. And here's a picture of the machine now hanging in my laboratory in California. And here you can see that you can experiment on a rotating object by having the gyroscopic forces cancel. You can collide this thing with something. You can swing it back and forth as a pendulum. You can play it. You can do all manner of experiments on rotating objects which have never been done before. So having constructed this apparatus, I have to then proceed to start doing experiments with it. The first one was the procession experiment. And the second one, and here is what happens if you process a little bit too fast and you crack off the one inch, put a little sharper focus back there. there you go. These are one inch diameter tool steel axles on there and the fly little weighs 30 pounds. And if you process too fast, they snap right off. So now this is one shot of an experiment. My thought was that if I got an inertial change in the force machine experiment in the procession of gyroscopes, I should be able to see the same effect just in a flywheel by itself. Because you know when you spin a flywheel in the wheel are manifested the forces of centripetal forces we know, or the centripetal forces depending on how you want to look at it. These forces increase in magnitude, and if you go too fast, of course, whatever you're rotating blows up. When they neutralize the forces which are holding the object together. Spinning ball bearing. Here, this picture is four feet on the bottom and three feet on the side high. One inch diameter ball bearing, like the sonic kind you have in pinball machines. The one that goes up higher is spinning at 27,000 RPM with the axis vertical. There's a non-rotating control. They're both projected up at the same initial velocity. And careful examination of this photograph shows that the rotating object goes up higher than the non-rotating one at a slower rate of deceleration, g minus delta g, and then falls at an acceleration of g plus delta g. And this, this was the first simple little experiment which showed me that there might be free energy. Go on, do you want to know? Uh, is that trajectory uh, 90 degrees to your camera? Yes, okay. yes, yes. And the stroboscopic light flashes are at 60 cycles a second. So after I looked at this photograph for about six months, you know, I did go to MIT and I did go to Harvard for a little while, and I was trained in the most classical and best ways by the best people. And the idea that anything like this could happen at all was off of the spectrum of what I knew. So it took me a long time to begin to believe what I was seeing. <clears throat> so in the sense of extraction of energy from space, what this means is, is that if you had a rotating object in a box and lifted it to a height h, 
and did a certain amount of work. The weight doesn't change of a rotating object, so the, the work you would need to do to lift it from the floor to a certain height wouldn't change if it was rotating or not rotating. But when you dropped it, it would drop faster and hit harder, so you could set up a cycle where you could extract energy from the gravitational field of the Earth in this process. And it's a non-conservative process. And this is the first simple <clears throat> archetypal physical experiment that showed me mechanically, right in front of my own eyes, that something anomalous was happening with rotating objects. Now, what's going on from this? Somebody had to do an experiment where we got rid of the effect of the air. Because people would say, well, the air is too And so we dropped a gyroscope in a box, protected from the air, in the setup with two phototransistors to time it. This was not done by me, by a couple of my students. And uh, 15,000 RPM rotor weight, 4.75 pounds, case weight, 2.48, rotor diameter, 4.5 inches, total weight, 7.23 pounds. This is the setup. You drop the object through the light beams, rotating and non-rotating, and then you time it. So with the results of this experiment, here to a high degree of accuracy, five significant figures, plus the standard deviation, and the analysis, it turns out that we have a 97% level of confidence that a fully encased spinning gyroscope drops faster than the identical gyroscope non-spinning would release to fall along its axis. And this is a very important experiment because what it shows is that not only what is happening to the gyroscope and affecting its rate of fall is in operation, but that same thing is happening to the case, too. Because if you figure out what it would take to push on the case, a force that you would need to apply to the case to make it fall as fast as it did when it was rotating, non-rotating, you have a fictitious force of 0.38 ounces, which would have needed to be applied to the non-rotating situation to make it fall as fast as it did when it was rotating. And the fact that you don't have to apply that force in this experiment means that there is a field or some effect generated by the rotating object, which is not only affecting it, but the case which is around it. So with that, we started to do experiments like this. Here we have two of these machines suspended from the ceiling of my living room. And there's a television camera on the left one focused on a target on the right one. Now, the experiment was a pendulum experiment where we wanted to find out that if we suspected that the rate of fall of an object was affected by its rotation, then the period of the pendulum should be affected too. Because under normal circumstances, the pendulum is only dependent on the length of the cords. It doesn't depend on the weight. That's why pendulums are used for timing. But if the weight drops at a different acceleration, then the period will be affected. So we did an experiment where we wanted to set these two up so that they would synchronize and swing together unenergized for like five minutes without drifting out of phase. And then, since we knew the changes in the inertial mass were small at these low accelerations, we tried to do a differential experiment where we would start the both swinging, but one was rotating and the other was not, and we thought that they would swing out of phase with each other for a while, after a while, but what happened was that they actually dragged each other along. So we discovered right away that there was a field around the rotating object, and it could drag against an identical control object. You know, they're both the same weight, the aerodynamics of the camera and the target are the same. We did things like that. The thing was very carefully set up. The monitor is in the background. You see the target on it, the camera focused on the dummy camera. Here is an earlier setup where you can see the whole thing perfectly. And here's a, a thing in motion where we took the camera's way and just used a pointer. And the pointer points from one machine to the other to the target, and you can see how the